Hey everybody, thanks for joining us here today. This is Nicole with Topaz and I'm very excited to welcome back Blake Rudis. Hey Blake. Hello. He is here today to talk to us about developing a workflow with Topaz plugins integrated into that workflow and I'm super excited to see what he has for us today. Blake is a three-time self-published author and the founder of EverydayHDR.com and HDRinsider.com. He has recently developed the zoneedit.com, and that's zone-edit.com. And this site is going to be devoted to his Photoshop post-processing technique that utilizes the limitless potential of the zone system, which is awesome, and the power of Photoshop to capitalize on the contrast in images. So definitely check that out if you have a chance. With that, I will go ahead and turn this over to Blake. Okay, excellent. At first, as always, I want to start this off by saying thank you to Topaz and Nicole for always giving us a platform to learn from and help each other with um, our workflows. And that's what today's whole topic is about, is about workflow. Now, the thing about a workflow is that, well, all the advertising for this from my side was all about uh, A squared plus B squared and the Pythagorean theorem, and there really is no set formula for a workflow. Now, you can build a workflow based on an idea of a formula, but there's always variables, and unlike a math problem, there's always tons of variables. So what I have here is the most simplified version of the things to look for during your workflow that you are going to be creating. Now, uh, this is a downloadable on um, Everyday HDR, which um, Nicole will be giving that link out uh, later. Um, I don't want you to go there now because I want full and undivided attention because this is about how you can take Topaz products and really forge an incredible workflow to make effective, impactful images that will have your viewers captivated. Now this is a 15-page workflow formula that you can download at the very end of it. It's got a printer-friendly version so you don't have to waste all your color ink trying to get that. Um, so you can put this next to your desk just as a, as a look through so that, you know, as you're working on your images you can see what it is that you should be doing. So the first thing I want to show you is just how powerful a workflow can be when you have a 1600 ISO image, one picture, um, and you take it to the next level with an effective workflow. I didn't have to use any HDR tone mapping for this. This was all done with tone, Topaz products and an effective workflow. Um, so a workflow is basically like a series of steps, it's a checklist, um, and all images are different. But what I really want you to walk away with from this, if you don't remember anything else, and if you, if you brain dump all of this, I want you to just key in and factor on one thing, and that is an efficient workflow forges an effective image. So how efficient you are with your workflow will dictate how well your photographs come out in the end, and just how much impact that photograph has on the viewer. The best part about this is that once you get efficient with that workflow and you can reproduce that workflow, reproducing impactful images is a snap of the fingers. It's, it's that easy. Um, so let me just go ahead and show you the before image. Again, I said this is an ISO 1600 original non-HDR. Uh, this was taken um, at night just about um, as blue hour was ending, but there was also a lightning storm going on. So I was trying to catch lightning streaks, but they were too far away. So all I got was lightning glow, but it made for a very fun uh, post-processing. So I'm just going to go ahead and go right into that, uh, that uh, image and we will be doing our pre-processing. So pre-processing is all the stuff that you do first. And typically, I do all my pre-processing starting right here in um, Adobe Camera Raw. Uh, there are many platforms you can use to do your pre-processing, like Lightroom, or even Topaz has Photo Effects Lab that is really great for doing your pre-processing as well. And during the pre-processing, you want to do all of the, uh, the nitpicky things just to get your image ready and set to go. So for this, I'm really going to be looking at, is the image straight? Because if you don't start out with a straight image, you get all the way to the end after you've done all your sharpening and then you straighten the image, you're in for some trouble because if you straighten an image that's been sharpened, during the straightening process, it actually blurs the pixels as it transforms that image into a straight line depending on what you pick. So if you don't start out with a straight image and you go through your whole process and then find out at the very end that you have to straighten your photograph, um, you, you'll find out uh, pretty... Uh, pretty quickly that um, your detail has been destroyed by that process. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to zoom into my horizon and I'm gonna just going to go and use my straighten tool up here and just go ahead and make sure this is straight. Now 
I don't know if it's straight or not. Um, my eyes aren't level. I, sometimes I rest my head a little to the right, so all my images could be a little bit crooked. So I, that's why I always go for what I know is a straight line, which would be the horizon. All right, so always start with straightening first, and then you can work into some of the other things here. So I'm going to go into the temperature first and just kind of look at what I want this color temperature to be. Now, I know if I go too far to the right, it's going to look yellow, and it wasn't yellow that night. So um, I could go with what was as shot, but I kind of like the, the, the leaning more towards the blue side. So I'm going to put that at about 4,900 and bring the tint up just a little bit. Um, and that should be about right there. That should be good. So then the highlights in this image, I'm going to really only focus on the highlights because when I look around back here, I see that I'm losing some of the, the, the detail that's in that sky because the highlights are so blown in the area where the lightning struck. So if I reduce the, sh the highlights just a little bit here, if I reduce it all the way, I can really bring out a lot of detail in the back, but then I reduce the highlights in the whole photograph. So it's kind of a give and take. So I'm going to go with like a negative 20 on the highlights there. And, uh, and be right about there and be good. The next thing I want to focus on are my chromatic aberrations. If there are any chromatic aberrations in this image, I need to focus on those first so that if I do any of my processing, I'm not um, sharpening a chromatic aberration or um, doing anything technically uh, good to the photograph on something that's technically bad. So if I look here, I do have some chromatic aberration on my trees and on my power lines. It's not that bad, but I'm a stickler for chromatic aberration. I don't like it. I know it's a natural thing, but I don't like it. So I'm going to click on the uh, lens corrections up here and go to color and then remove chromatic aberration. Sometimes just a click of that button will remove the chromatic aberration. Other times you need to move the fringe over on the purple amount. And let's just do it on the green amount just for uh, safety's sake. So that's pretty good. If we look at our before and after, we can see that that did cut down a lot of that chromatic aberration. So I'm just going to go ahead and open my image. So that's our pre-process. The next part of our workflow is going to be the noise reduction. So every photograph has noise in it. There's no way to get around that. Even back in the days of film, noise wasn't necessarily called noise then. It was called film grain. And some film speeds would create more grain than others at higher ISOs. And we have the same thing here in the digital world. So this was an ISO 1600 image out of a Canon 60. It's a pretty good sensor, so 1600 is good. My first camera, if I went to 1600, it would be a noise nightmare. So this isn't actually too bad, but I'm going to reduce the noise anyway. Um, so I'm going to zoom in pretty close. And always, before I do any plug-in work, I always duplicate my layer. So press Command or Control J to duplicate the layer. And I'm just going to go ahead and call this denoise because we're going to use denoise for that. So I'm going to go to Filter, Topaz Labs, and Denoise. Now, you have many noise options out there, um, but I have yet to see one as powerful as Topaz Denoise. Um, I'm not just saying that because I'm on the webinar with them now. I'm saying that because I absolutely positively mean it. So on the left-hand side here, you have all your presets. Now, I do like presets to get you started but I'm also a big fan of going into the detail work over here on the right-hand side with the technical work. So if I go over to Raw and go to Modify, that's what I'm going to start with because it gives me a nice baseline for noise reduction on this photograph. Now I want to go into areas that are going to show me uh, the detail that I'm either um, resurrecting or losing in the process of making that adjustment. So if I go to the overall, I'll just go ahead and leave that at 0.15 for now. But in the shadow areas, I want you to see that the shadow areas are going to be the trees down here and the grass. If I leave the shadow at 0.13, it's blurring all the detail in the shadow areas. So if I go ahead and bring that all the way down, I now get that, that um, shadow detail back, and I'm not losing that in, in the noise reduction process. But if you look at the sky, I've got myself a nice-looking sky. So it, the, free of noise, I should say. So then when I go to the highlights, if I increase the highlights all the way up, I just want you to see something right here in this area of the trees. If the highlights are all the way up, uh, you start to lose all of the detail that are in those highlights. So I want to bring those highlights back because I really like the character that that tree had. So I'm going to bring the highlights all the way down. So then if I go into the channels here, you have the red channel and the blue channel. That's what you increase to... Um, to round off the noise that's in those certain channels. But you can actually go into the channel to see what noise is being produced 
by that channel if you go up to preview mode. So if I go to preview mode and go to red, anything that you see on here that's not gray, that's white, those are red areas where noise exists in the red channel. So if I uh, bring that up, I start to decrease the noise in those red channels, but the, what I also lose is any character of red also. Like in the light you see down here, how it's less vibrant when I bring that all the way up. So I'm going to bring that to about uh, negative 0.65. Now the blues, let me go into the blue channel and show you that too. So in the blue channel, I see there's a lot of blue noise around the tree and it's also around the power lines. So if I were to go to the blue and increase the blue, I now lose that blue noise that is around the tree and the power lines and I can go back up into that preview and show that, that it does take the edge off of the blue noise that's there. So then in the clean color section, that'll just help clean up any um, of that color noise that, that's being, that exists in the photograph. And typically where you find noise, especially at higher ISO, is going to be in the color noise. Um, so let me go over here to uh, this power line here. It's a good reference point for that. Um, and look at what the effects of the clean color are if I bring it all the way up. If I bring the clean color all the way up, I lose a lot of color in that power line itself. And if I bring it down, I get a lot of the color and the detail back in that power line. So just be cognizant that while presets are great, getting really into the nitpicky details of it is really what's going to make it shine. And when we're talking about a workflow, every image is going to be different. So with every workflow, things have to kind of change a little bit. You have to uh, pick one thing up and put it here. Um, you may not have to reduce the noise if you shot at ISO 100. Um, you may have to really reduce the noise if it was ISO 3200. So I'm going to drop the recovery detail a little bit here also. And then I'm also going to drop the blur amount. And you can see that that made a change in that power line. So I'm going to go ahead and press OK because I think I'm pretty much good here in denoise. Now, the next place I'm going to go to is addressing the variables. So the variables in an image that are always constantly changing are going to be your foreground, your middle ground, your background, your contrast, um, your curves, your levels. Um, there's all kinds of things that are, that are variables in images. And the reason why they're variables is because you may need to address the sky in one photo and the foreground in, a, in another photo. And sometimes you don't need to address the sky at all in one or the background or the foreground. It just depends on what is needed. Now in this photograph, I know for a fact that I want to work on the ground and the sky independently so that I can bring out um, both and make both of them uh, kind of their own separate layers and have their own separate punch that they wouldn't normally have. All right, so let me go ahead and fit this to the screen. So there is our, our denoise. You can't really tell uh, by, by looking at the noise visibility level here, uh, the eyeball here. You can't see it from far away. Noise is something that happens up close. So now we're going to address those variables, the highlights, the shadow clippings, levels, curves, contrast. This is where um, you start to get into um, all of the baseline stuff and clean all this stuff up before you start doing all of your artistic expression. Now you can start doing your artistic expression now if you wanted to, but watch what happens when you address all of these variables first and then start adding artistic expression like colors, textures, so on and so forth. So what I'm going to do, as always, Command or Control J to duplicate that denoise level. And I'm going to go to Filter and go to Topaz Labs and Topaz Adjust 5. Now the thing here is I know for a fact that I want to separate my sky and my, and my ground. So this is all, all the adjustments I'm doing here are going to be for the sky and the sky only. So if you see stuff happening to the ground, don't worry about it. It's only about the sky at this point. So I'm going to bring up my adaptive exposure here to really bring out that sky, start to get some drama going in that sky, and increase the regions to 50. I want it to be very small regions. Now, if you can imagine this, if it was four regions, you imagine yourself dividing this canvas into four pieces, so four equal parts, and that's where all of the action happens within those regions. So as you make those regions smaller, little minute details start to come out and be more prevalent than they would at the smaller regions. So the contrast, I'm going to go ahead and hike the contrast up a little bit here, not too high. Just about that 0 0.7, 0 0.69 area, that, that looks about right. I'm going to drop the brightness because I really want this to be dark in the sky. And this is where I'm going to start getting um, the contrast in the sky um, all mixed up and nice and, and, and deep and dark. So I'm going to bring the protect highlights up and the protect shadows up so that those areas don't get affected as much by the adjustments before. 
and I'll go ahead and press OK. So now, because I have the sky done here, there's some things that I want to do to the sky, and I want to sharpen up the sky. And I'm only going to do this to the sky. So what I'm going to do is press Commander Control J, and I'm going to go to uh, Filter, Topaz Labs, and go to Detail 3. Because Detail 3 is amazing for me. Now, um, recently I watched uh, Nicole's uh, video on the noise, uh, or the, the detail and sharpening, output sharpening, and this, that, and the other. I learned a lot of cool stuff from her that um, a lot of times, and this is a discussion that we've had before, um, you know, you make, a, you make an adjustment because you just know it looks good, and you don't know why it looks good. But that's where uh, I learned a lot from Nicole about these boost uh, adjustments here on, on these sliders. So with the small details, I'm going to go ahead and increase those small details. Now remember, I'm only doing this for the sky, so I, I'm only going to be really curious about what's going on with my sky here and not necessarily worried about what happens to the rest of my photograph and I'm going to address that later. Now when I increase the small details, I'm also going to drop the boost on those small details so that any sharpening that happens in those shadowy areas of those small details, it starts to kind of blend in a little bit better. So instead of it being really sharp and crispy, if I bring this all the way up, in those shadow details I get a nice blended amount, but I can still kind of work those details around the edges a lot more. And that's what I like about this. I'm going to do the same thing with the medium details. I'm going to bring up the medium details and then bring down the boost on the medium details to get that same effect. Now for the large details, I'm just going to go ahead and bring that up a little bit to get some of that definition in the clouds. And then the exposure, let me go ahead and zoom out here because now I'm working on the image as a whole as far as the sky is concerned. I'm also going to bring the exposure down a little bit to make it even, even deeper and darker back there. And then I'm going to bring up the highlights a little bit because I want to resurrect some of the the the, uh, the lights that are in those highlights, and then also bring up the shadows a little bit to do about the same, and then the whites and the blacks as well. So now I've got a nice dramatic sky. I can go and say, okay. So I know what you're thinking. I only wanted to affect the sky, right? Well, both of these layers only were to affect the sky. This is detail. I'm going to press. Commander Control J, or not J, Commander Control, and click on both of them, and then Control or Command G to make them a group. So now this group is just for this guy. So now because they're in their own group, it's the two of them combined. So now if I make a mask, it only works for what's in this group. So I'm going to press Control I to invert that mask, and now I get to be a painter. I get to paint in all of those effects that I just made for just my sky. So anything I paint in white on this layer is going to bring back all that drama that I added to the sky. And this is where it gets fun. This is where you get to do those selective editings. This is one of those variables. The variable is the sky. I only want to affect the sky. I don't want to affect the foreground. So that looks about good for me there. Maybe I'll just do a little bit more up top here. That's good. So now what I want to do, I've addressed the sky. Now I want to address the foreground, what's happening down here. And this is where clarity is going to come in. I'm going to press Command or Control J on the uh, denoise layer because it's below the sky. So anything I do on this denoise layer is not going to affect the sky. It's only going to affect the foreground. So I'm going to go and call this clarity. So as I said here in the workflow before, let me see where we are here. Um, I've addressed the background. Now I'm addressing the foreground and the middle ground. And the contrast and the curves and levels and highlights and shadows clipping, that's pretty much coming from all the stuff that I'm doing in Topaz Lab. So I'm really knocking out a lot of those pieces to my workflow formula here by going into these programs and doing it within the programs. So with Clarity, let me go ahead and reset all these to make sure I don't have anything going here. With Clarity, um, I'm going to want to increase my micro contrast. And I'm only working on the foreground. So don't really concern yourself with what's going on with my sky right now because I'm doing these in these little bits and pieces of variables. So I want to increase the micro contrast to really boost up what I'm seeing down here, especially in the road. Um, it looks really cool in the road when I increase this stuff. The low contrast, I'm going to bring that up to about 0.8-ish. Now, like I said before, sometimes it's what looks good, right? Um, now, every image is going to be different. So what you see happening in this uh, 
photo with these adjustments, it's not going to be the same with yours. So just because I did this to this photograph doesn't mean it's going to do the same thing to yours because right now I'm affecting the dynamic range of the photograph and every image has a different dynamic range, right? Um, so now, why I like this, because look at these contrast sliders and really pay attention to what's happening in the trees. I'm very selectively editing those areas in the trees to bring out the detail in the trees that was lost during uh, the exposure. You know, and it wasn't really lost during the exposure because while you can do a lot in camera, there's only certain things that your camera can actually do. And one of those things is only really capture one instance of light at a single time. It can't do what HDR can do, and it can't do what our eyes can do, because our eyes see 23 different stops of light at any given point in time. That's why I can see the light that's in the left corner of my eye and see the screen right now. My camera couldn't do that. So now we're getting the ability to manipulate these things to make people see what we saw. So was this a depiction of reality that I'm doing now? It may or may not be, but the idea is I'm the artist here. I get to show what I want the viewer to see and I get to bring the viewer into my piece and, and make this look like an impactful image. It wasn't an impactful image before. So now I'm also going to increase the black level here to really clean up some of this area in the foreground at the bottom. And I'm also going to increase the midtones a little bit here too. And I'm also going to do a little bit of that with the white as well. Now, one of the other things I want to do here, because one of the very powerful things in Clarity is the HSL filter. If you look at anything that is green or yellow in this photograph, it looks pretty mundane. Now, if you know when you're out in a storm, the light that happens, um, it really does bring out the greens. So we just had a storm here last night that was absolutely gorgeous, and if it wasn't raining so hard, I would have brought my stuff outside to, to photograph it, because the light that you get before, during, or after, uh, actually not really during, but um, before and after a storm is incredible. So I'm going to go ahead and increase the, the hue of my yellow to really bring out the green in that yellow. And then I'm going to go to the saturation, bring up the saturation quite a bit. Not too much. I don't want to go all the way up to 1.0 because then it, it's too much saturation. Um, just th about there is all right. I'm not a big fan of, of oversaturated, like really saturated images. Um, and then bring up the lightness a little bit in those areas as well. So now we have a good foreground. Now, like I said, I was only doing this for the foreground, so I'm going to go ahead and press OK. Now, there's no need for me to make a mask in this in, um, in Clarity here, uh, and there's no need for me to make a mask in Photoshop either because what's above this layer is what's already been done for the sky. So that's kind of taken care of. So the one thing I also want to do with this, because one thing I couldn't really attack in detail was these corner areas here. If you see the corners are really dark, and while I do like uh, the darkness of those corners, I want to bring them out just a little bit. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a curves adjustment layer. So this curves adjustment layer, see how a mask automatically appears here? I'm just going to press Command or Control I to turn that black. Um, actually, I'm going to keep it white for now. I'm going to make a, a very simple curves adjustment to open up the light in that uh, bottom clarity. I'm going to go ahead and make a um, clipping mask by pressing Alt or Option and holding in between those layers so that that curves adjustment only affects that clarity. Now I'm going to go ahead and press Command or Control I to invert that and then paint again in white only in the areas that I want to resurrect. So if I paint in white there, it's only in those corner areas. So that's one of those variables. It comes up. Sometimes variables come up as you're working on the stuff. So it's not like a math equation where you can always just do one click and, and, and have it good. So I'm going to press uh, Control, Shift, Alt, and E, or Command, um, Shift, Option, and E to make a stamp. Now, this is like a, a visibility stamp. And this stamp, anything that happens below here doesn't really matter anymore. I can even put these in a group and make them disappear if I wanted to. I can even delete them if I wanted to because this stamp is only in control of what's happening on my, um, my, on the top of my layers palette. So everything below kind of just starts to, to fade out. It doesn't, doesn't really matter. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into Topaz Restyle because I want to add some artistic expression now. So I've adjusted all the variables, I've addressed all the variables, and this does look like a pretty good photo that I could go ahead and post to Facebook and watch the likes come in or 500px if I have any friends. 
Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into restyle to add some artistic expression. So on that visible on that top stamped layer, I'm just going to rename this restyle so that I know what it is. It really helps to rename all of your layers here. Go to filter, topaz labs, and go to restyle. Now the reason why I like that, I mean there's a lot of things you can do in Photoshop with color, we all know that, but restyle gives me color palettes that are right in front of my face that I get one click and I can see all the stuff that's going to kind of happen to the photo as I click on these layer, on these uh, different presets over here. I do like this Byzantium ink um, preset here, enough that I actually googled Byzantium ink to see what it was, <laughs> so that's pretty cool. Um, but the thing about these um, colors is that sometimes you get a little too much color. Uh, it's giving me too much color in areas that I don't necessarily want color, and I want to adjust them also. So I'm going to drop the opacity on this layer to about 60% and then change it to the soft light so that it adds some drama to the photo. And then I'm going to go into each one of these colors, into the hue of each one of these colors, to add some more to it. So I'm just going to bring this up just a little bit here in the primaries. Now if you look at what's happening here, if you look in the corner of this photograph, you can see where the primary colors are affecting this photograph. So now if I increase the hue or decrease the hue, I can see what happens to my image as I do that and see what I like. Now if I bring it down here, I don't like that. I don't like what it's doing in the secondary area there, but if I bring it up, I do kind of like it. It's adding more purple to the photograph. And I can do the same thing with the third and the fourth and the fifth. Um, and I'm also going to go into the basic color of all this stuff too. So if I go down here to the um, temperature, I'm going to drop the temperature to make it a little bit more blue in that area up there. And I'm going to increase the tint to make it a little bit more purple. And then the saturation, I'll go ahead and increase that a little bit in the black level and then the mid-tones just a slight bit because I like the drama that's happening there with the dark image. So that looks about good to me. I can either mask this right here in uh, Restyle or I can just go ahead and press OK and I can mask it in Photoshop, which I'll probably do that and mask it in Photoshop. Now, if at any time, because we, we also we made all these duplicate layers of this stuff, so if at any time the adjustment that you do doesn't look exactly how you want it, it's not that big of a deal. You can just go over here to the opacity adjustment and you can drop the opacity of that to get it to your liking. Also, you can play with the blend option. If you want more soft light to make it more dramatic, you can do a dual soft light on this one. Or you can go to luminosity where you just kind of want the, the effect of what that restyle did, but you don't want the color along with it. I want the color along with it. But I'm going to go ahead and mask out, just very, very simply mask out my, uh, my bottom layer here, my painting black on that layer mask there. All right, so I'm almost done with the artistic expression phase of this. I'm going to go ahead and press um, Command, Shift, Alt, and E again to make another stamp. And then I'm going to go to Filter, Topaz Labs, and go to Lens Effects. Now I want to show you um, the, the gradient, the ND grad uh, adjustment here, where I can really um, get into just the, the a top section of my photo and only make uh, a, a very... Um, a graduated adjustment from the top to the bottom of the photo to kind of blend in a certain color, a certain effect. So how I always start with lens effects in the in the graduated ND adjustment is to bring the brightness all the way down, bring the transition all the way down, and then I can modify the amount to see where I want the end of that transition to be. I want the end of that transition to be right where the uh, the ground meets the sky, and I only want it to affect the sky. So if I if I increase the transition here, you can see that as I increase that transition, it's not affecting anything down here and it's, it's, it's a graduated thing. It's kind of like a gradient that goes up. So then I can also increase the brightness here too. Now that I have all that set, I know exactly what's happening with that ND adjustment. And if we look at the, at the original and then look at the after, we've got a lot more drama and a lot more color happening in the, in the top of our image. And I really like what's going on there. So I can press OK. Again, another artistic expression. If I had an ND filter on me while I was shooting this, I could have done the same thing. But, you know, that's the cool thing about, uh, about a workflow is that you can do it later. So one of the last things I always do, and if we look at our workflow formula here, is I went over pre-processing, noise reduction, addressing all the variables, 
the artistic expression by adding some more color to this. The artistic expression is also when you would want to add um, maybe um, a vignette or um, a, a texture or something like that. Then we can go into sharpening. So the sharpen layer that I'm going to do here is really only going to be for the foreground because I already sharpened the background when I did that in detail way back here with the sky. So if I go ahead and go onto that layer, let's go ahead and call this a selective sharpen layer. I'm going to go ahead and go back into Topaz Detail. If I can find it. Oh, they're in alphabetical order. Yeah, that's nice. I used to work at a video store, so I know all about putting things in alphabetical order. Um, that was my college job. Now with sharpening, I always make sure that sharpening is one of the last things I do. Sharpening is a very subjective thing, but you can also accumulate a lot of technical flaws during your sharpening phase. If you over sharpen, you can really destroy the, the integrity of a photo um, and, and make it um, not as impactful. So this is where you really need to watch yourself uh, with sharpening. So I'm going to be sharpening only for the ground and not for the sky. So I'm going to go about my process the same way here. I'm going to be using uh, Topaz de the uh, Topaz detail settings for the overall, the shadows, and the highlights. Now before, I only showed you the overall. Here's where you can get really into it and go into the detail of uh, the really nitty detail of a, of a photograph here. So I'm going to sharpen. I typically only want to sharpen stuff, for me, the stuff that's in the foreground of the image because as we look at things even in, in everyday life as we look over a scene the stuff that's in front of us is the sharpest and as it goes farther beyond it's not so sharp so that's kind of what I'm going to be doing here so I'm going to increase the small details and then also drop the detail boost of those small details um, you can see a pattern here on how I work I increase the small details and decrease the boost on the small details thank you very much for this tip Nicole it is awesome awesome lifesaver um, so then I'm going to go into the shadow detail. So I've already increased the detail overall of the entire photo. Now I want to get into just the shadows and hit the shadows pretty hard too. So I'm going to increase the small details of the shadows and then decrease the boost on them just to kind of glaze them over just a little bit. Helps them seamlessly blend together. That's why I really like the boost adjustments. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and drop the medium boost a little bit. And I think that should be, let me drop the large details a little bit in that too. So you can see the detail that's coming out in this row that wasn't, I mean, look at the cracks in, in the paint on, on, the, um, on the, the road here. That's pretty incredible what I'm coming up with there. And then go into the highlights and do the same thing there. Go ahead and increase the highlights, decrease the boost a bit, increase the medium details, decrease the boost. And uh, it's pretty much... Uh, how I go about doing my, my sharpening in, in detail. Increase a little bit on the details, decrease a little bit on the boost. Now I'll show you what happens if you go more on the boost. Um, you end up getting a more detailed effect. Uh, but it also comes with that technical flaw. If you take these too far up, you're going to have more technical flaw than anything else. So I would keep them at a minimum um, if you're going to go too high. But then again, it's all personal preference. So you're free to do what you like to do. It's, it's subjective. Your workflow is subjective to you. So I'm going to go ahead and press OK. And now, if you see here, that went ahead and affected the sky too. So I'm going to do the same trick that I did in the last three masks here. I'm going to go ahead and make a mask on this layer, Command or Control I to um, make it all, all black. And then what I want to reappear, I'm just going to go ahead and paint with white. Now, like I said before, when I sharpen, I like to sharpen the stuff in the foreground and really bring out the stuff in the foreground and leave the background be, OK? Um, for the most part, unless what's in the background is what you want to be sharp. Like I said, it's subjective. It's up to you. Um, so this is essentially um, every piece to the puzzle. Now, there's one thing I do want to add to this, and because Topaz is doing a giveaway with their package, and I'm doing a, a giveaway with the uh, zone system, I want to show you how the zone system can be incorporated into this. So I've already done all the, the bulk work to this photograph, and now I'm left with one more thing, and that's just to add all of the, uh, the zones to this photograph to see what I can create. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go ahead and make a duplicate of this by going to the history palette, making a duplicate. I'm going to control shift E and flatten this entire photograph and then press play on the zone system action that I have here. Uh, what that's going to do is it's going to create a duplicate of this layer. 
make it black and white because what it's doing is it's taking all the tones from the image and it's making a very selective adjustment for those tones. So it's taking zone zero, zone one, zone two, zone three, zone four, um, all of the zones within this photograph uh, that are on that 11 point zone system and creating um, a way that I can manipulate just what's in each zone. So you can see anything that's on that really dark black uh, area in the photograph is going to show up in zone zero and all the, the really vibrant whites are going to show up in zone 10. So I can make a group of these by pressing shift and pressing con command or control G to make a group and I'm going to press and hold shift and drag that right back on top of that. So all my zones now are on top of this image. The zone system itself when you run the action does not do anything for you but break down the zones for you. Um, so what you do is you get those zones and then you can go in and you can edit them. So if I press alt or option on this mask, I know that if I were to do any adjustments to zone zero, it's only going to be affecting what's in zone zero and in those areas that are white on the mask. So I'm going to go into zone four. I'm going to start with zone four because I, I don't really want to edit too much in the dark areas here. If I go to zone four and go to the properties of zone four, I'm going to go ahead and, and increase the clippings a little bit on the whites in zone four. And I only want that to affect, what this is doing is, if I look at, at the, the image right now, um, this image right now has a lot of haloing happening around these trees. This is where the zone system can be used to, um, to make halos kind of blend. If you look at what's happening here, uh, actually you can't see it because I just turned the eyeball off. Um, if you look at what's happening here, it's taking all of that halo area and kind of trends blending it in with the rest of the photograph. If I don't want it to affect the, photo, the color, I just go to luminosity and change the luminosity of it. So in zone 5, typically in zone 5, I'll make a, a, a little S curve here, and then I'll go ahead and change that to luminosity also. Now, one of the things I love about the zone system, the digital zone system, is that you can go into, say, the, the uh, zone 10. And in zone 10, we have a lot of what's going on in the background here. If I were to modify the clippings and make that area darker, I can start bringing back a lot of the tone that was in uh, those clouds there that I've kind of I've lost during the whole editing process. But you see, I'm starting to resurrect that area. So I can do the same thing in zone nine and start to bring back a lot of the detail in even those blown out areas. What, what was blown out is now being recovered because I'm working on a, um, a raw image. So that's the basic idea behind the zone system is you can get really nitpicky on all the tonal value in each one of those particular zones. And it can be used at any point in your workflow. You can start your workflow with this, you can end your workflow with this, you can start your workflow with Topaz, you can end your workflow with Topaz. It's the, the, the possibilities are really limitless. So if you have the full, um, the full Topaz collection and the zone system training, which the, the package that, that is included is three hours and 40 minutes of training on how to use this package. So I don't just give you the action and say, have fun. Um, I give you three hours and 40 minutes of instruction on how to use it to better your photographs so that's the basic idea behind your workflow. Remember what I said in the beginning of this. There's a lot of information here. Um, so the only thing I want you to take away from this is an efficient workflow forges an effective image. I've spent years modifying my workflow. I continuously improve my workflow. It's ever changing. It never stops. If you're an HDR insider and you see the workflows that I do every month, it's different for every photograph. But it all meets the same intent. And those same intent is what's listed right here. Pre-processing, noise reduction, addressing variables, artistic expression, sharpening, and then saving. Awesome. Thank you so much, Blake. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Bye-bye.